so then we can start. So we are just going to move on a little bit with the uh, hypothesis testing. Um, we did mainly the general work uh, last week. And so today we are going to review a little bit and then look at some more specific tests. So, um, so this is what we, um, the sort of concepts that we were uh, discussing last week. Um, so in general, a hypothesis test is we saw some claim about a large population, large system, something that is too large to survey completely. Um, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, are you filming this class today? Yes. Uh, with uh, sound? With sound, yes. <laughs> it's a good question, actually. It's better than it's uh <laughs> because we had trouble with the sound, so I'm. And um, yeah, we are now filming with sound, as far as I can tell. So we have some large system or population here, which we cannot completely sur survey. And so some claim is made about this. Um, and we usually. try to formulate this claim in terms of some parameters to make it possible to to work statistically about it. And then the picture is always like this. So we do a small sample. Um, so I if it's a statement about the population mean, like a mu, the sample information that would be relevant is typically the sample mean. Yeah. So we talk about the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, usually called H0 versus H1. Um, we saw in general that we always need what we call a test statistic. And the sort of key to making hypothesis tests work is that we can talk about the distribution of the test statistic assuming H0 is true. So we could make an observation of the test statistic and tell whether this is in line with the H0 or if it's a striking or contradictory to H0. Um, So usually we observe the test statistic on some scale, for instance, if it was this thing that we called x bar minus mu s over square root of n. I think we call it either set or t. t. Right. And then we, we saw that with some assumptions, for instance, this would have a standard normal distribution. So it lives here around 0 if H0 is true. And then for a one-sided test like this, for instance, you would get a critical direction this way. And if T observe this here, we define the p-value as the probability of observing what we did or something even more critical. And the the p-value then is the probability, right? Yeah. So somehow, as normal distribution sits here, and we judge this observation compared to what would be if H0 is true. So we talked about, I mean, all of this, we cannot go into all the details about this again. Uh, talked about type 1 error, for instance, was the possibility of rejecting H0 even when this was true. And we don't want to do that with any high probability, at least. So we said that alpha would be the probability of a type 1 error. And we typically want this to be low. Um, 
So this alpha here is the significance level. And let's see. Yeah. So all of these concepts were, were in the sort of technical part last week. Um, And we worked in particular with this this uh, special example with the with the ground meat. Um, where the alternative hypothesis said that mu was greater than ten simply. This was the test statistic in that particular case. And we saw that if H0 was true, we could use a standard normal distribution for this. This is assuming uh, the sample size is large enough. And the p-value, as you remember, is always probability of say if, if the name of the t uh, test statistic is t so it's the probability of having t more critical than what we actually observed so for the meat example more critical means simply higher up here more to the right And um, the fundamental mm -hmm. rule of deciding in a hypothesis test, we are to choose when we see our sample, we see our test statistic, uh, we are to choose between keeping this H0 or to reject it and say that this is true. And the rule of this is look at the p-value compare it to alpha, and if p is less than alpha, we reject H0. In that way, we make sure that we have the probability of type error under control. Yeah. Okay. Going. Yeah, so now this is the general idea, and now we're going to look at a few basic cases uh, and do that in some more detail. And we're going to do a little bit with SPSs also today, see how these tests are implemented in, in SPSs. So I'm not sure exactly how far we are getting today, but this is at least the list of what is happening in chapter three. Um, we're going to extend this meet example and formalize it a little bit to make something <coughs> called a one sample t-test, probably most of you heard about sometime. Um, we're going to look at something called a binomial test for proportions. Um, something called a two sample t-test. And then we're going to have a little look about okay, what happens in the case that samples are not large. And finally, if we make it today, we have something called a test of normality. So I'm not going to tell you what that is at the moment, but we'll see when we get there. So let's start with this so-called one sample t-test. So it's called one sample t-test in SPSS. It's also sometimes called a single mean t-test. So 
it is usually what we do to test hypotheses about a uh, population mean and a single mean value. So it's a test situation that is somehow similar to this acne meat, the ground meat example there. And just to make it conform to theory a little bit more, we are going to use something called T distributions. That's partly why I call this T in the first place. Okay. So T distributions are going to be with us uh, all of the time in this course, I guess. It's very fundamental in statistics, in the regression analysis, and also in this basic testing. So what are T distributions? Well, they are similar to the standard normal, but for each uh, integer k, so if k is 1, 2, 3, you have something called a T distribution with, we usually write Df for degrees of freedom. So there's a slightly different distribution for each different value of k. So we can talk about uh, a t variable like this one is distributed as, for instance, t with df equals k. It's just a short way of stating that this guy has a, has a t distribution with k degrees of freedom because that's a very annoying thing to write all the time. Um, okay, so if I put like this is a particular distribution with seven degrees of freedom. Uh, so these guys, these uh, T distributions, they resemble than standard normal and when this degrees of freedom is somewhat large we sort of try to draw the line around 30 to say from 30 and upwards is a very good approximation to just use interchangeably the t distribution or the standard normal so i think there's a picture here yeah um, where the black curve is the standard normal distribution. Uh, the red dotted line is uh, T distribution with two degrees of freedom, which we have here. So we see that it's very similar in shape. It's just more spread out than the standard normal. And when you go to 10 degrees of freedom, it's the green thing here. So what's going to happen in a more or less, we're not going to do very much manual or maybe nothing at all in fact. In a, in a basic statistics course you would normally have tables for these t distributions and work a little bit on that. Um, I suppose we are not going to do that in this course but SPSs will give you t values all the time. So you should know about uh, what it is about. So clearly, if I put uh, an observed value here, and I talk about the p-value in this sense, the p-value is going to be a little bit different whether I use, say, the green curve or the black curve here. And that's the difference, uh, mainly in this testing. So you should just, there are some horrible mathematical expressions giving these densities and so on. And if you look at the Wikipedia, you can see them exposed in full, uh, full horror. 
but we are never going to work on that, in fact. So we just need to know there's a family of distributions for each integer, and the higher the integer, the closer it will be to the standard rule. I think that's more or less what we need to know. So then continuing on what we call the one sample t-test, <laughs> we are going to focus on what we usually call the large sample case, that's n greater than 30. Just by convention, it's used n equal to 30. There's no sort of scientific rule telling you why that is, but it's just you have to make a rule of thumb, so you put 30. Um, so in general, this you have alternative hypothesis, which is always one of these three. So it can be a two. And this mu zero here is, is a constant. For instance, 10. Right? So just if you want to think of a number, you can use 10 or 7 or whatever. It's just a constant. And this is used to specify the null hypothesis saying that mu is equal to mu zero, while the alternative can be, in different cases, either one of these. So it's a, these are so-called one-sided alternatives, and this is a two-sided alternative. Right. So clearly in the meat example, we were in case number one here. And the idea is we have this population, we have this claim, H0 versus an alternative about a mean. And we just need to observe something. And we are observing the same as before. We are going to be just a little bit more general about specifying the what we call the null distribution. This is an important concept, null distribution. This is the distribution of the test statistic if H0 is true. It's called a null distribution. And it's always the null distribution that makes possible the computation of a p-value. And the p-value makes possible a judgment of rejecting or not rejecting H0. So this is very important. And in this case, the test statistic is like this. So it's basically observing the, the sample average. But we sort of standardize it in this way. We subtract. Actually, it should be mu 0. So you subtract the constant that is involved in the null hypothesis. And you divide by the standard deviation and square root of n. And then the, the sort of general result here now is is that we used to say it's standard normal. We now say it's t distributed with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, where n is the sample size. So this can sometimes be a little bit confusing because we switch quite frequently between using this, these two. And you should always keep in mind the similarity of these distributions when the, the degrees of freedom is large. So if you do a computation with a t distribution and the degrees of freedom are 50, you might 
almost equally well do it on the standard normal. And this is, without further mention, it's often just done automatically. So whatever it's most suitable at the moment. But the formal result, in theory, is this guy under the null, dis null hypothesis would have a T distribution with a particular degrees of free. So th this is the result about null distribution for one sample t-test. Yes. So we talk about uh, critical directions. Um, So you should just remember that the critical for the test statistic, whatever it might be, whatever you're doing, the critical direction is always whatever points to H1 being true. Yeah. So whatever it's, uh, we feel, or <laughs> not feel, but whatever we, we see constituting a stronger and stronger evidence of H1 is the critical direction. And clearly, I mean, it's, it's, um, usually no big problem to detect what is the critical direction. So in these cases, for instance, if you look at uh, the number two there, you have a mu zero here. And the statement of the alternative is that mu is actually lower than this. So you would like to see x bar somewhere down here to substantiate h1 in this case. Yeah. And this critical direction, it just uh, um, transfers to the t statistic, which I now took away. But clearly, a value to the left of mu zero for x bar is the same as saying I look for a negative value of t, right? So it it's just inherits this direction. And clearly, for number three, it's it's in both directions, for instance. So it's just written here. I, I write, it's a maybe a little bit confusing. I say upwards, downwards. I mean, this is up and this is down on the line. It's not up like this. Um, So in many cases, whenever we work on a data material, we are not we are going to use or to let SPSS do the calculations of the p-values. If we have to do something by hand, we will resort to the standard normal ap approximation here.
So here is a very typical example of a warm sample uh, t-test. Yeah. In this example, something like 3, 2 from the compendium, actually. So we have bottles to be filled with 0 0.5 liters. And there's a huge number of them pouring out of a machine. And this machine feels a little bit different in each bottle, but it should be on average half a liter in each. So in quality control, you would have an alternative saying that this machine is not working properly. <coughs> and it's not filling at the correct average rate. And if data tells you there is evidence for this, you should take some action and fix the machine. So that would imply stopping the machine, stopping the production, looking for mistakes, and so on. So it's kind of a costly thing, and you would not want to do it unless you're pretty sure that it's correct that it's not working well. So therefore, you put up a test with the alternative like this, and you seek solid evidence in some way for this. So typically, you would test it at some low significance level. I guess this would be typical 0.05. Okay, um, so then comes the sampling. We look at 30 bottles. It's kind of the small sample that we can do with what I call the large sample theory. So we're just in the border here, but that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Based on this, we observe slightly higher average in the sample while the standard deviation in the sample is quite small, showing that this is a fairly stable production process. <coughs> and the question is, this is somewhat higher than the, the good value 0 0.5. But the question is, is this a significant warning or significant sign that something is wrong? That's what we are testing here. So the question is, or let's do it more technically, we have to put up our test statistic. Um, let's say this is the general expression. Let's look at the observed value. It has uh, zero point so it's what is there, you end up at 3.04. Um, the null distribution here would be T with 29 degrees of freedom. And this is on the limit where we feel comfortable about using the standard norm normal approximation, but we'll do it anyway. Okay. So here it goes. Here is null distribution. Here is the observed value. And since this is a two sided test, remember that we now have a critical direction in both ways. So my p-value, yeah, okay, it's a probability that um, 
either t is greater than this one or that is smaller than the negative of this. So it's critical, you have to just put it on both sides. It's more or less uh, mechanically what you do when you have a two-sided test. So it's actually going to be like this, t greater than 304, or t less than minus 304, which we, of course, realize by symmetry. Standard normal is symmetric, and all the t distributions are also symmetric. So it's two times the probability that any of these And checking a normal table or using some software, you would see that this is something like 0 0.0024. And this makes sense given this number because we know the standard normal. It would very rarely happen that you come more than three standard deviations away from the mean. And this is what we observed. So it's not very probable. It's actually this not probable. And clearly, if alpha is 0 0.05, the p-value is much lower than alpha. So we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. So in practical terms, this machine appears not to work properly. We should stop it and fix it, even though it costs a little bit of money. We are quite sure that there's something wrong when we observe this large deviation here. Okay. Okay, so let's do, this is sort of the school book way of doing such a test. Then there's the practical or applied bit where we try to use SPSS. So, let's just look at an example from the find some interesting files here. Uh, this file, I think we maybe saw it once. It's just about transportation. Uh, data, so these numbers here is probably for some vehicle routing or something. There's a set of customers and there's distances between the customers. And it's observed the distance and the, and the traveling time for each of a number of trips, right? So it's not something very exciting maybe, but um, using it just for to, to demonstrate the SPSS. So let's, that's a file. Okay. So suppose they have some model here, this might be in, in a city for instance, and they have a model where there is a parameter and the parameter mu is, is said to be the mean time. 
of intra-customer trips in this system. And suppose in this model it's assumed that mu is 20. It could be a computer model, for instance. And then, based on recent data, they might suspect that this parameter could be wrong. So the model should be updated somehow with a, say, a new parametric value for this. So if you just want to sort of test whether we have evidence that this is wrong, you could use a two-sided alternative like this. OK. So then it says here is 20. And we have to then observe x bar somewhere. We have to observe s. We have to find the sample size. And with these components there, we are able to sort of decide the test, because this is what we need to, to compute the observed value of the test statistic. And so we could, of course, compute all of this with SPSS and do handwork again. But now we want to show you how the whole thing runs in SPSS. Um, so let's just write down here the test. Two-sided alternative, like this. Um, So first, before doing the test, let's just uh, do some exploration of this data. Um, let's do the simplest, maybe here. So I want the number of cases, that's the sample size. I want the mean, that's the x bar, and the standard deviation. So this is exactly the few figures that I need. And the variable is duration. Like this. So it turns out that in the sample, maybe it's difficult to see, but it, this is 24.3. The standard deviation is 6.8. And um, Sample size is 200. So it's a comfortably large sample, and we're fine for doing the test. Um, OK, so let's see. This is going to be your first, for or not all of you, but for those of you who have not worked with SPS before, it's your first test. Um, so I'm now going to run exactly this test. And you go to compare means. You see the second line there says one sample t test, which is what we want. Then we have to say, OK, which x? We have a population. That's the population is all intra-customer trips. We have a sample that is 200 intra-customer trips. And we are observing, we are talking about the mu, which is the mean of some variable. And the variable is the duration. So clearly, we have to specify which variable is, is uh, under test here. So it's the, the duration variable. Um, then options. We don't need to do anything here. There's a confidence interval here. You can change it if you like, but we don't need that. And then we have to specify this value. We have to say what to compare x bar to in the test. So it's going to be 20. And that's it. And now you see that 
in this test t test output I get all the numbers that I initially looked for so I didn't have to do that previous check you get the sort of main statistics for the for the variable and then we get something that is interesting here is the output for the one sample test so it outlines the test value is 20 that's my mu zero t you can imagine what that is it's a t observation right So if you like, you can verify that if you take 24.3 minus 20 and divide by 6.8 over the square root of 200, you're going to get 8.92. Then there's a figure DF that's agreed that's the degrees of freedom. I usually use capital letters, here it's small letters, but it remember it was n minus 1 for the test statistic. So that should be 199. And this number is all important. It's called SIG. That's the number of cigarettes you can smoke before solving this problem. No, it's not. It has to do with the uh, significance, actually. SIG. And it's actually wha what we like to call a p-value. <laughs> These chokes are breaking very easily, or I'm too hard on them. And what do you see about the p-value? Well, it's practically zero three decimals when it's I guess you know this here but for some reason these computer systems sometimes like to write numbers like this it means so maybe mm -hmm. it's possible to change it in the SPSS uh, uh, settings there but it will typically write you would skip the, the, the final zero if it's a decimal number. I don't know exactly why they do it. I don't think it makes easier reading or anything. So This is the same as 0 0.241 in, in normal writing. So the p-value in our case is practically zero. Yeah, okay, p zero. 0 is clearly less than 0 0.05. Um, observe here carefully that it says two-tailed two -tailed, uh, significance, two-tailed p-value. It means it's the p-value for the two-sided test, right? And in this case, this is exactly what we want. So it's okay. We can directly use the, the output here to conclude that this observation at 24.3 is a striking evidence of H1 being true. Actually, that mu is greater than 20, it would indicate. So that's, that's how it looks, and then let me do this slide before we take the break. Okay, so let's, let's just see the output again. Because there are a few more numbers here, there's something called a mean difference here. And this is just um, it's just this difference here. It's four point three. 
And then there is something called a 95% confidence interval of the difference. So I don't think we are going to use this very much, but it's okay to know what it's about. It's simply Uh, it's a confidence interval for for the difference <laughs> between the parameter and the claimed value here. So if you take mu zero plus three point thirty six and mu zero plus 5.26, so this is 20, so this is 23.36, and this is 25.26. This is a confidence interval for mu. So you can check that this is OK. I'm not even sure why they bothered to put it here, but it's there. What is important for us is these three guys here. And there's one thing that we need to be very careful about when interpreting this output. <coughs> is the fact that SPSS will consistently produce the p-value for the two-sided <laughs> test, right? So if we have 20 here, um, we could have had the alternative could have been mu greater than 20 it could have been mu less than 20 and it could have been which it was different from 20 right so the two-sided alternative so um, SPSS will always assume this one and then give you the p-value. So when you're in one of these guys or one of these situations, you must um, You must check that x bar is on the critical side of the mu zero before uh, using result. And if it is, the p value for the one sided test is one half of the p-value for the two-sided. And which is exactly the same as it's a half times the p-value from SPSS. So the reason why you take a half here is, of course, because when SPSS does this computation, it, it looks at the t-distribution. It has some observation either on this side or on that side. But in any case, it will add both of those two for computing the p-value. If we are in a one-sided case, Suppose this is t-ops. Um, then t-ops is either not on the critical side, or otherwise the p-value is just this piece. So you check this x-bar on the right side here, the critical side. And if it is, the one-sided p-value is half of what SPSS does. So just to 
consider those two alternatives. That's what I have there, but it could have been a situation where this was the alternative, then x bar is not on the critical side. We have x bar up here, and for this alternative, the critical direction is this way. So you should just sort of keep h0 on basis on that fact. And you don't even want to look at the p-value from SPSS. It could be higher, it could be low, but it doesn't mean anything. On the other hand, if h0 was mu greater than 20, like this, then the critical direction is here. Our x bar observation is on the critical side, so the t observation will also be on the critical side. And we are in business. We then have to check what is the two-sided p-value. It's very small. So let's say here, x bar is on the critical side. p-value one-sided is then a half of the SPSS p-value, which was uh, 0.0024 or something, so 0.0012, I guess. And clearly reject. So if you just think slowly about that, it's not going to be too complicated, but be aware that SPSS always give you the two-sided people. OK. How much break do we need? 10 minutes? If we take 10 minutes, we're going to finish five minutes earlier. Uh, det problem at jeg har ikke så veldig mange eksamensoppgaver, for vi startet kurs i Løve om, omgjort ganske mye fra i fjor, da. Er det mulig å få omgjort mye fra i fjor? Altså, første gang det gikk i denne formen her var i fjor, sånn at vi har... Uh, er det mulig å legge ut svaret fra i fjor, eller? Uh, det er litt dumt å gjøre øvingsoppgaver ut fra at du kan du feil eller ikke. Ja. Det... Um, Kanskje mulig, skal vi se. Hei. Send meg en e-mail, for jeg husker ikke. Nei, jeg skjuler det. Hei. Er det ok? Mhm. Det er nice. Sure, sure. Well, this was a bit of a challenge, but mm. I think I got it. I think. I'm not sure. And this, this part was actually easy. I just... I have the SPSS at home. So I could... Ja, yeah, ja. Yeah. Copy the tables right inside. Mm. So I think it's okay. Uh, where? Just put it in. Uh, oh, was there a, a form of. Hmm? Like a formal form of sending? No. No, no, no. It's okay? Yeah, it's okay. Thank you so much.